glossy and looks as if it had all the oil in the world and really hasn't. Marvellous. Okay, well, we looked for a reduction and that's what we were doing. We uh, got that chicken stock down until it became so viscous that it almost seemed like oil. Now, um, we're going to compare this with the chicken tetracini. We have actually 305 calories in that little get-together there with only 6 grams of fat in it. And uh, that meant 2 grams of that was saturated fat, which is what hung around with the chicken breast. We got 16% of calories from fat for the whole dish, which is a knockout. And then 86 milligrams of cholesterol, which is good, and 282 of sodium, which is super, and down to five, um, uh, well, up to <laughs> five milligrams of the fiber, which is something we're always looking for all the time. Fiber is such a good idea. We'll talk about that one day. All right, and then I just want to get some of the vegetables as well as a piece of the chicken. I'm almost going to have to see <laughs> Mmm. Oh. Mm. The dill. I'm sorry, my mouth is so full. The dill is so good and it's so juicy. And you can feel that round mouth fullness. It's just great. Try this. Mm. Don't forget the springboard, you know? Your own idea. <coughs> well, mm. Great dish coming up. It's called sweet stuff. <laughs> You'll have no idea what is that. It's parsnips and hammocks and <laughs> my glasses. And I'll be right with you. <laughs> if you're under if you're under twelve years of age and watching at the present moment, now you know when Mum says. Don't eat, you know, don't eat with your mouth full. Don't talk with your mouth full. You have to eat with your mouth full. All right. Um, this dish here is, a, is, as I promised just now, <laughs> in the midst of everything else, um, it's going to be another reduction, and this time a ham hock reduction. And what I did here, um, same, same thing with the, you know, just to remind you of the technique, um, mark it off when it's full in the saucepan, and then see how it's got... And it's, you see, it's 50%. So that's right down, that's a half reduction. Sometimes you'll see in recipes 75% reduction or 85% reduction. Now you know what they mean. Okay, so that's put on there and that's going nicely. I just want to heat that up just a little bit. And um, here is a parsnip. Now I, you know, I'm British. I mean, you might have noticed by my accent. And uh, parsnips in Britain, it's just wonderful things. Especially, I believe, when they're nice and small, like this one. They've got a heavy root in the center or a heavy core in the center. If they're very large, you'll have to take that out because it'll be not very good. So this is cut up into about um, quarter inch pieces, tiny little pieces, to extract as much as possible, you know, the flavor from it. Okay, and um, that's put over here in just two pints or four cups of water. Now there's 20 ounces, if you've got a weighing scale, 20 ounces, about a, um, you know, two and a half cups of the parsnips and you just bring the heat up underneath and start boiling them. And when they've boiled for about 10 minutes, because you don't want them completely soft, you know, you want them just a bit of texture in them, they'll look like this. And that four cups of water is important for what I'm going to do with it. Now, because you see you've got perfectly cooked bits of parsnip, but you've also got flavoured water underneath. That parsnip, because it's so sweet, has a wonderful flavour water. All right? So now that goes into this pot here. And then raise the heat underneath that so we get it really boiling hard because that water is going to be for the pasta, for the, for, for the actual boiling of the pasta itself. And this is going to be for the sauce. Now I can see because I've got moderate intelligence every now and again, that I turned on the wrong element here. So this one's, so I'll turn that one on. And I, you know, if I worked for NASA, I'd never get anything off the ground. It's high tech for me, a high touch I love, high tech's beyond me. All right, um, so that's going well. So you see what happened there. We've got this um, now going to be boiled up. And into there, because this is a ham hock stock that I've used, I took the ham hock and pressure cooked it. If you saw the last program, that's how I did it. And it's got meat on it as well as fat. So you take the fat and the skin off and chop all of the meat until it's very, very lovely, lovely taste, but no fat in it, all right? Very important. And just drop that down on top of the parsnips, which is in that reduced 
ham husk tart. So the reduction is going here like this. And now you've got the parsnips, sweetness, and that saltiness of the ham hock stock at the same time. Terrific stuff. Okay, now, um, then get the pasta. And the pasta is actually going to cook in two minutes. And I'll tell you the reason why in just a second. I'll just take a couple of strands out there and put the rest of this into the hot water. Now, this is just coming to the boil here now as water. And I just rest that and uh, waste nothing, and show you one of these pieces. Hmm. Uh, is it to, yes, that is going to boil. Um, this is called angel hair, and it is the finest of all the pastas. It's a tiny, tiny little shape. You see, isn't that great? And this can come in the bendable form. Well, actually, that bends pretty well. Oh. Um, but the totally bendable form, which is the, the, the raw pasta, which you can get in little packages at the supermarket. And um, that will cook in 30 seconds less than this will. <laughs> Terrific. Can you imagine? The main nowhere in the world would you ever get people who would actually go and buy something to save themselves 30 seconds. It's just cute, but still, there we are. And you say, oh no, that's not the reason why we do it, because there's a subtle difference in taste. <laughs> basically, sorry, that was a rude noise. Um, basically, uh, there is probably some textural difference, but quite frankly, if it's made with hard durum wheat it, and, and made by well-meaning people, it's going to do just fine. All right, so that's boiling, not exactly vigorously, but it's boiling and it takes two minutes to be able to do. Now, how to make a sauce out of this one? Really quite simple. You just take two tablespoons full of arrowroot and four tablespoons full of, of the, um, just look subtly off camera. Hello. Here, hello. I was subtly off camera just to see whether it was two tablespoons or not, you see. And uh, my friend Robert looked at me in her. <laughs> so we still don't know, but it looked like two tablespoons, and there's enough here to justify two tablespoons, so um, we just pull that up, um, always put something metal underneath, save scorching the board, take it off the heat, and then pour the, that um, arrowroot into that mix. Now, I don't want to get one of those sickling <laughs> kind of thing. With the reduction, you want enough gloss in it to make it seem like the, the, you know, the textural change in the mouth without being sort of totally clogged up. You see, it's got to run smooth. And that's just perfect. So you put that back on the heat and just get that up to the boil and put a tablespoonful of parsley into the top of that and some freshly ground pepper. So isn't it simple? I mean, this is just easy. About this time, you've had the two minutes of the angel hair. I bet you'll be into angel hair. Two minutes, eh? Amazing. And just stir it all around, make sure that it's just cooked. It should be just nicely al dente, which means to suit the tooth, al dente. You know? um, wouldn't it be great if you were a dentist and his name was al dente? You know, Italian dentist. Oh. Um, so uh, into the pan, there it goes. And uh, always do this to be able to rinse out the pasta. Never, never, never rinse pasta under a cold tap. Dreadful shot at dawn stuff. And then throw away that pasta. There's, there's no point keeping that. And then the bowl is nice and warm for the process of tossing. And then you can take the sauce from here and just drown it. Look! <laughs> I know what you're saying. It's more like a soup than pasta. Fine. Good. That's exactly when you've got fine reductions like this one. That's what you want to do. You want to have the sense of eating something which is robust enough and gorgeous enough so that you can dig into it. Look at that. I mean, <laughs> doesn't it look great? Um, just and a little bit of the garnish, you know, uh, over the top. And, and th these things are so handy. You try to do it with a pair of tongs and you'll find out. All right, let's compare the numbers and see how it works. Oh, a little bit of parsley on the top, first of all. And uh, just, just a little extra parsley, it never goes wrong. And just a little touch of the old black pepper. I love it on the top because, you know, when you eat and you get that, just that marvellous little bite, just, just as you're getting into it. Oh, and, and, and it works so wonderfully well. Just to get that little, sorry, Jeeves, um, get that little spike, you know, on top of it. Okay, now, um, there is the dish. It, it looks fine, it's steaming, it's just great for one of those cold nights. 
And here is a dish I wanted to compare it to. This is a classic. And it's just about all I can do not to get dive into it. It's just marvelous. A little prosciutto, a little dried ham, and some fresh peas and bathed in cream with parmigiano reggiano, with the parmesan cheese which comes from Italy. It's just gorgeous. And the numbers for these, for this great dish, is written in red here, over here on the board. And, um, and of course, the other ones, which we'll do it in green, is uh, the dish we've just done. So, 1,054 calories for the, uh, the great dish, 503 uh, for sweet stuff. And now fat, 67 grams. Now that's enough, you know, I'm a, um, a 2,000 calorie a day man. <laughs> um, and I just get by on 2,000 calories a day, great stuff. And so, but I need about 60 grams of fat a day to within that percentage, about 30%. So I've gone, I mean, just in that one dish, I've had it. But at 11, it's good. Okay, saturated fat, 38 down to four for those who are watching saturated fat. Percentage of calories from fat then is down to 19 from 57, which is good stuff, around about 1925, I, I like. Cholesterol, 320, that's down to just 27 now. And sodium, 1,542, that's down to 1,003. And just up a little bit with fiber at nine, which is always a good thing. Okay, let me just have a little nosh at this one. Did you know that nosh is British for eat? <laughs> um, and uh, with pasta like this, perhaps uh, because it has long strains like that, you can just wrap it around um, until, <laughs> oh dear, am I going to choke again? No, please. Ah. Mm. Oh, mm. that's the reason for sweet stuff. It's, um, it's just bathes the palate, and that reduction is just wonderful, okay? So, do enjoy it, and um, lots of love. Thanks for being with me once again. Look forward to seeing you next time. Bye. <laughs>
is going to hit you right in the nose. You're going to inhale and you're going to think you arrived in heaven. Well, Chinese heaven, whatever that's like. Okay? So do, do have a look at this dish. It's a great little technique called Bao Xiang. <laughs> Okay, well, this is another one. There's great ways in which Asian uh, influence can come into Western food. It's called fusion, and it, it literally, from the East comes a great idea and meets a Western idea, and they, they sort of overlap and, and become more of the sum of the two parts. So, anyway, and what I've done is taken a traditional uh, European oil, if you will, the olive oil or the canola oil, which is also called rapeseed oil. It's rather unfortunate, but that's the name of it. Uh, and the, the, this particular oil, the one that I'm accustomed to using, is uh, um, a very, uh, it's called extra light. And that doesn't mean to say it's light in calories, it means it's light in flavor. It, they actually deodorize the oil so that there's none of that fruitiness, you know, of the extra virgin olive oil, which some people absolutely adore, but other people don't like it. So y you can be the choice of that one. And then um, I also have just a little spot here. Let me pour a little bit more into the grass. This is toasted sesame seed oil, unrefined. And it's a little bit saturated, but I use so little of it. And it's got the most wonderful, gorgeous flavor. Now, that is very Asian. So you make a marriage of the two just by putting in one sixteenth part of the toasted oil to the, you know, to the untoasted, <laughs> to this extra light, and put it together. And that's a monounsaturated oil. But this one, canola oil, is also monounsaturated. It has a lot more monounsaturated. So it's good from that point of view. Trouble is, it's a little unstable, and if it's exposed to light, you know, it can get a bit fragile. So put it in a dark bottle, keep it in the fridge, and it'll do just fine. All right. Here. Take a little bit of that with just that little flavor of the sesame seed, about a quarter of a teaspoonful. You don't need much at all. It's just enough to be able to break out the natural oils, which smell gorgeous, this explosion of fragrance. Tell you what you need for that. You need four spring onions, green onions, uh, you know, whatever they're called around the world, scallion. Um, and a clove of garlic is the second of the three musketeers, and the third one up is this. Now, I don't really know what that is. And if you don't, don't be too upset about that because, um, you know, some people don't. Uh, for example, we went to a school the other day just to find out how many people really knew what this was. And this is what we got. I smelled it. I smelled it. I think it was a dinosaur bone. Hamburger. <laughs> I think it's a ginger ale. I'm an elephant with a truck. A doggy bone. I don't know what it is. A gingerbread man. Mom, I'm cooking anything like this. I don't cook anything like this. So, so I guess I don't. So I guess um I don't know what it is. A root. Is it um a horsey? Mmm. Yes. Uh, maybe it, may, it smells like a flower. A uh, big fruit. A oh, stick. It smells like a bone. No, nope. I can't guess. Something to eat. Now, I, I, that, that's what it is. You know my favorite one of this one, of all of those that they did? was the dinosaur bones. I thought that was, obviously they'd seen something recently and so, they, or Bigfoot. <laughs> Some of those were really tremendous, thank you. And if you're watching at the present moment, young man, and your mother doesn't cook with this, <laughs> I bet she'll cook with it now when she sees how it works. All right, good. Here then, this is how we get it together. The white ends of this, and um, please you don't have to worry about being very specific about how you cut it up because it's all gonna be squashed anyway. Uh, so put those on one side, we'll use it all up in a sec. And then the clove of garlic, you see, normal stuff. Uh, just bash it quickly and chop it up, and so that's ready. And then the actual ginger itself. Now, here, what I, what I actually need from this is about 10 thin slices. Um, and since it, it all comes together quite quickly, <laughs> I've also cut it in a rather large way there. I think I'll probably put up with about five because, you know, multiply them by two and, you know, 
I understand. Um, so that goes on one side. You can, by the way, keep that in a little pa brown paper bag and then put it into a Ziploc um, bag, you know, one of those things, and put that in the refrigerator. And that will keep uh, for weeks and weeks and weeks. All right. Now, here in the pan, I've got the, um, the oil that I put before. And just simply dunk that down into the pan. And instantly, that's that what actually happened in 23 seconds in the studio, instantly you get this absolutely phenomenal flavor bursting out of this. It's, it, you must do the experiment just to see how wonderful it is. Okay, whilst that's just um, frying along there for a moment, take a little shrimp. Now, the, these are uh, 40 50s, which means there could be 40 or as many as 50 to the pound. And just take a sharp knife blade and run it down the back like so. And then just um, peel the, the, um, the shell off from either side. <laughs> I did one earlier on. It's just incredible how easy these things come out at certain times. And I was so pleased with myself. I was just doing a little run through just on my own, you know, just to see because I, I really would like to do this with such great skill. I mean, you know, just so that there would be a shark in intake of breath. And of course there isn't, so <laughs> put that on one side. Keep that for a, a little stock um, uh, with all the shells. They make great fish stock. If there's any sand track, sometimes you can get very gritty sand track in there. It's just the, the, the sort of little eating device. <laughs> now that I, I've got you all excited about it, you just wash your hands. No point to it, really. It's all very sanitary. And you just don't want grit in the dish. Um, so there they are. I've got 12 ounces of those. Now, here in that pan, just when it's thoroughly now releasing its mix um, of flavors, dunk one cup full of chicken stock into the top. And instantly, this ar aromatic cloud is just fabulous. And, and you're going to be excited about that. All right. So when you've got that in there, just take that up and... Uh, we need to strain this now. Now, um, here, just to show you what it looks like. Strain it then down into a little pot like so. And get every little bit out because this is going straight back on the heat again in order to get ready for the next stage. So when you've got it strained, oh, press it down. Just, just because it'll be a little soft at this stage, so just squeeze out every last little morsel of flavor that you can from it then toss it out. It's not worth anything else. Okay, so here we are. Um, we're going to put that back in the dish in just a second. Just a little of the toasted sesame oil again. Just another little teaspoonful. Well, not half a teaspoonful, probably quite enough. And get ready, then drop in those shrimp. Now, 12 ounces of shrimp don't take long to cook at all. Just wind the heat up so that it's a nice high heat underneath the pan. And just toss them around. Good. Wonderful. Now they, they'll take just about a minute of tossing around and you notice that there's a little pattern of oil in the pan but not much. It's not swimming in it as you sometimes see. Here then is um, a mushroom and the mushrooms are cut into quarters and I've got eight ounces of those and those are just simply dropped down on the top as well and given a chance to just get to know the shrimp just for a moment or two. Happy coincidence if you happen to be in the same pan. And, oh, there you go. Oh, there is stray bodies there. And there it is. Good. You remember the, the little extraction that we made there? When this is done, you just simply pour that Baoxiang mix on there. That's the little extraction. And then the mushrooms and the shrimp can cook in there just for a moment or two. I'm going to make this into a soup. You could serve that over some pasta if you wanted at the present moment. Um, or so over some rice would be more probably culturally correct. Um, and then you take the green ends and cut them diagonally towards you um, so that they make a, a different sort of shape rather than the normal shape, you know, straight across cut. There we go. And they're all ready to be able to sprinkle into the soup. Then one tablespoonful of the greatest Asian seasoning ever, fish sauce. These are anchovy style fish that are allowed to soak for six months <laughs> until they go 
fermenting, you know, rotten, you could say. And it has the most charming flavor. It really does. Good, a great aroma. But when you add that aroma to the rest, woo, I mean, stand back. This is real food. And then just simply stir that together. Give it about one minute now so that you've got, in fact, the mushrooms and the shrimp come up to the boil. I don't want too much of a boil. You see already I've got a slight foam on the top. That's not what I want to see. I want to be able to get it out into the bowl and I've got clarity. Oh, look. And the mushrooms should be sufficiently cooked so that they burst in your mouth. So that they, 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 they're so full of lusciousness that they burst. Okay. <laughs> Let me turn all this off because I can leave pans on and that's not a good idea. Okay, come and have a look at the numbers. They're really interesting. I've actually compared this with a, with a classic dish that I love, which is, of course, the gumbo. All right? uh, a shrimp gumbo is just a, a wonderful thing. By the way, remember what we were trying to achieve. The bao xiang, the explosion of fragrance, can go into any kind of dish, really. I'll, sh I'll share another one later on. But in this particular event, it just gets up underneath the food and makes it so neat. Um, so I'm going to call this a kind of Thai soup. And a classic soup was, you know, with the, the shrimp um, that I, a gumbo. Um, OK, so I've got 99 calories out of that, which is really quite a drop. But of course, there's a lot of rice in the gumbo. Um, fat is 15, that's down to 3, that's a good drop, and only one of which is saturated, which is fine. So that gives me this soup at 24% of calories from fat, and with low calories, it's a nice way to start a, a, a dinner. Um, 80 um, uh, of cholesterol, milligrams of cholesterol, and down 315, which is largely that fish sauce, um, on sodium, way down from here. Dietary fiber... I've only got two there, unusually, but, you know, that's because of all the rice and everything else and, you know, in the gumbo. Okay. Now, I want to get one of those mushrooms there. I, I know what the shrimp's going to taste like, but first of all, the bao xiang is just amazing. I'm steaming up my glasses. Mmm. Oh, God, it looks so good. Oh, oh it's... It's nectar, and that mushroom did just what it did. It bursts with that flavor inside the mouth. You've just got to try it. Man. Shrimp's nice and crisp and that green and things. Well, anyway, now, you know, the whole idea behind this is take the technique and then wrap a little recipe around it like that one, but then it is to springboard. That is so important. Don't forget the springboard. Now, my springboard today is actually going to be a new dish, brand spanking new. It's an invention of mine for Chris Rauco, who happens to be my senior editorial assistant. And uh, she had a baby recently, not on her own, as Michael was her husband, and, um, and called Anna Sky. So this dish is named after the innocence of that perfect little child, all right? And it is an innocent little dish. Come and have a look. It's actually always a wonderful time when, when some member of our team has a baby. It's, uh, it's really special, and we're kind of a family. Okay, so there's a little of the ordinary oil, and there's just a little, 50% quarter of a teaspoonful of each of the toasted sesame, unrefined sesame oil, and also the, um, <coughs> in this case, the very light olive oil. And, all right, so it's a monounsaturate. Now... Um, into the pan, roll it around, a little bit higher temperature than normal because I've got about eight minutes to do this in and I want to get that chicken cooked. All right, now those, those um, are four ounce to six ounce. You can't, you know, it's just so much you can do with the recipe, isn't it? I mean, you, you get somebody like me who says four ounce and you go rolling into the supermarket and there's no way you can find a four ounce chicken breast on that time. Well, then going to have to go up another ounce. I'm sorry about that. It's just one of those things. It's a little bit imprecise. You can't, otherwise, you're sort of making pills and therapy and stuff. And that's not what we're into. We're into enjoying life. You know. OK, so we take then the Baltzyang idea before. You remember how that was done? You just simply take the white off, and you don't need to make a big feast of that. Keep that on one side. And then also the very thin slices of the ginger. 
And um, once again, because I've started in this rather expansive way, that should be enough for me, about five slices of that. Um, normally, it would be about the size of a 25-cent piece, and that's what I would try. If I was doing this as a stir-fry, of course, what I would do would be to uh, peel it properly and then cut it up into very fine little pieces so that I would be able to arrive at it in the whole stir-fry. But I'm going to just express this out and get the extraction going from it so I don't really need to have to worry. Okay? All right. Um, so this is gone, and then you just simply get a small pan like this one. doesn't have to be in a wok. A little tiny drop of oil again, always very small, enough to be able to break that aroma loose. <laughs> i got a piece in there, sort of seems to want to get together with the chicken breast that's come out before your time. Um, stir it around <coughs> and get that going. Okay. Now these are cooked with the skin on because they are much more plump and flavoursome that way. But you might notice something special about these as they're cooking. They're plumper than normal. And that's for a very intriguing reason. What I'm going to do with this is just simply take a de-alcoholized wine, not chicken stock now, as we did with the technique, but one, two, three, four, half a cup of that de-alkalized wine, and then let that simmer right down until there's only just about a quarter of a cup left. So I want about a 50% reduction with that aroma going from it at the same time. That looks like this. And so you press it again slightly, but not too much for a very interesting reason. Take that out, and you see the cloudiness of it. This is full of the Baltzang flavor. Now, this is where the sort of East meets the West idea. Um, I've got what looks like a, an ordinary hypodermic syringe. It truly isn't. It has a very blunt end to it, in fact, squared off. You just couldn't get it into a vein or anything else like that. And um, so this is called a hypomarinade. So you take this, and you take the chicken breast, which I must just turn once again. I want these to, to cook beautifully, naturally on, on either side. And don't those look gorgeous? You know, they're all plump and, and all over again. Um, here, then, is the chicken breast. Now, I'm going to take this marinade and, and just pump it in. See how that plumps up there, like so? You see? Isn't that incredible? This is going right in to that muscle, inside and out. Now, I'm going to put about a fluid ounce, um, well, almost a fluid ounce, into each one of those breasts there. Now, what happens is instead of a marinade, which just softens the outside, this goes in the center and carries flavor inside. So that's why these look plumper than they would normally look. Oh, and the smell its coming off the pan. I've, yeah, I've got this coming up from here. But it's also in the center, and it's dropping into the pan and doing wonderful things. So I always cook it with the skin on because it keeps that, that succulence within the center of the chicken bone. All right, good. Now, over here, um, some boiling water. I just want to drop in some bok choy there. Now, this is a, a green leaf, white stem vegetable, which is an absolute sensation. And a large bok choy can actually go into that altogether. I just want a small amount to show you. But this is what it looks like. Have you ever seen one of these in vegetable shop? Just go and get one. You'll notice that it gets a certain amount of very fine earth in here. So rinse it out very well before you use it and just pass a knife through it all the way. And it, it actually cooks very much at the same time. It's, it's very crisp, that white root, but it's, but it's very tender at the same time. It's not a root stem. Okay, now let's have a look at these um, chicken breasts here. So we can take... <laughs> We can take the um, chicken breast, hold them steady, pour, pull off the skin here, always going from the bottom, and rip it right up, turn it over, and rip it off. See how quickly that works? It's such a simple idea. There we go. And now we've got a residue which is cropping up in the bottom of the pan, but that, of course, is also full of fat. So just lift the the chicken breast out of the pan, there we go, and then in a very quick manner just blot up those juices there which are just solid fat. That's fat. And remember I always keep these as fire lighters. Uh, 
and then pop them into a plastic bag and keep it as a firelight. It gives a marvelous feeling. And people say, are you barbecuing again last night, neighbors? And I said, no, we're lighting our fire. So now just a couple, just to deglaze the pan, couple of ounces, just pour it onto the surface. You see how it did away with the glaze on the bottom of the pan? And take just a little bit more of that, just a teaspoonful of arrowroot, and just a couple of, uh, just really a tablespoonful of the arrowroot there, and just pour it quickly into the pan, shoot it around, and what you've got built up there is a glaze, all right? Now that is just a glaze on the bottom of the pan. And then you can put all of those back in, just shoot them around. Oh, look how plump and gorgeous they are. And, and you see how they glisten now? Just fantastic. And all I need to do then is to take, <laughs> I feel like a short order cook. Coming right up, bok choy for one, you know. Um, breasted chicken, yep and just a little bit of the steamed rice here, just on the side. Oh, goodness. Simple, elegant, very much like little Anna Skye, who's just gorgeous and so simple and lovely person. All right, poured over the top, just a few little flecks of green onion could go onto the top of there to make it look nice, but I want to compare these numbers, so I'm gonna let that shoot. All right, off there. Come on, let's have a look. There. Now, looks marvelous. All right, that is a simple, elegant looking dish. So is this. And with the same vegetables exactly, I want to compare the classic, which is a saute with a cream finished glaze off the bottom of the pan. Very much a Northern European idea. Classic is in red, and the sky is in green. And I take my glasses off and can't see a thing. <laughs> um, 483 calories to that one, quite a drop. Six calories down from 38, and only one of those are saturated, which gives me a 10% of calories from fat veal, with only 58 milligrams of cholesterol, 239, look at the drop in sodium there, and just one up on fiber, as normal. And um, just a little bit of, uh, of a chew in here. I tell you, you know, this is the time that that I love most of all. You see how that comes together? You see how glistening that looks? And the smell of it is just... Oh. Lovely. Innocence. Innocence, it's so good. By the way, and one thing that's been occurring to me is... Um, mm, oh, Christmas, I love it. If you're worried about all these numbers and you want to get them done, and I know I go awfully fast about that, everything is in the book, numbers and the whole lot. So if you want that, it's there. This is just delicious. A little Anna Sky. <coughs> if you're watching at the moment, and I know that you're almost running around at the present moment, God bless you. Thanks for giving me the inspiration. Thanks for being with me. God bless you. Lots of love. Mm. Welcome to Graham Kerr's Kitchen. It's really two programs in one. This is a series that appeals to your creative side. Food that is sumptuous stuff. How could that be? Uh, this is a program about people who want to eat healthy and reduce calories. Actually, it's about food with an aromatic quality that fills the nose. Oh, sure. But it's also about keeping my arteries clean by reducing fat. But it doesn't mean a thing if the food isn't rich and colorful. Maximize the flavor. OK, but I must have healthy food that I can cook in minutes. I must minimize the risk. So welcome to Graham Kerr's Kitchen, where we get our heads together just for you. And indeed, welcome back once again. Look, tell you what, this is one of those programs that you wouldn't deny is full of vitality. I mean, if you eat this kind of food today for, for the rest of your life, you'll live forever. No, well, it's, it's strictly untrue, but you'll have a lot more life in your years rather than adding years to your life, okay? Come through. I'll show you. Um, I'm going to do just a simple little technique in there at the beginning, which is what I call stack and steam, and I'll show you that in a moment. Um, but really, the most important thing that I want to say to you now is... Um, 
when you grew up, were you terrorised by mum who said, eat up your vegetables? I mean, you know, it's supposed to happen everywhere all over the world. And there's a, co a common sort of vision, I think, when I've spoken to people. They say, eat up your vegetables, and you think of these poor, tired-looking things in a bowl like this. they barely steaming on the top. And, and, and the, if they had faces at all, they would look like this. They'd say, oh, God, you know, there's nothing... But, you know, it's just tired and pallid and everything else. But it doesn't have to be like that. You see, I think that you can steam a vegetable with fresh herbs added all over them. Just, the, um, and, and choose a herb that goes with the vegetable perfectly. And then season them. Spike it a little bit. Throw seasonings like fresh cracked pepper in as well. And before you know where you are, the whole vegetable dish is alive and saying, you know, with vitality, having fun. Well, now, that's what this program's all about, how to take vegetables that could have terrorised you and turn them into something that you can't wait to have a go at. You ready for it? Come on, let's have a go. Of course, for this, you're going to have to have some form of steaming device, and that's really important. And I'll show you a couple of, you know, great ones that are available at the moment. Okay, first things first, then. Um, on here, I've just got a shallow pan, and this is one of those devices that you can get quite inexpensively. They come from Asia, and it's all right, I haven't lost my marbles, you know. They, they, this, is, this is, you put marbles in the bottom of the container in which you put water for steaming. And if you do that, you can put about an inch of water in there, and if it should by chance boil down, you know, almost away, then these marbles, a tremendous racket inside the pan, and they'll let you know. Okay, now, the way this works is that there's just a large outside skillet, and then this is made out of bamboo, and you place that in there, just like that, all right? Place a lid on the top and help that water be able to come to the boil. Good. Now, the, the thing that, um, about stack and steam is you need various layers so that you've got those things which are hard to cook go on the bottom, and those things which are softer to cook and take less time keep on going up. I mean, you know, I, I suppose you could go this way. You can't go that high because the steam doesn't sort of generate enough to be able to cook things on the top. But you can go at least two or maybe even three levels. So this is just two level one. Um, I'm taking what I would like to introduce you uh, uh, to as the absolute king of the roots. Now, here are, are two root vegetables, and they are, you know, you look at it and they say, well, they're not the same, are they? But they're called by the same title, basically. They're called sweet potatoes. This one, because of its orange color, has a tendency to be called a yam, and this one, of course, is just a regular sweet potato. And this one has 10,000 international units of vitamin A when it's raw, okay? And this one has 600. So, you see, there's a real difference between that when you're looking for it. Now, now, now both are high and both are good, and they get vitamin C and calcium and, uh, and beta-carotene and really great stuff. But this is the one that I like to use the most because it's got color as well as all that nutrient. So, um, choose one of these. If you've never had one, just cut these at about half-inch slices through. Um, they're sort of, you know, I'd love... I don't know whether you do this sort of thing personally, but do, do you ever go to a lake and skip stones, or did you ever do that as a child? These would be smashing for that, you know, because they just fit the thing, and you'd just be able to get about a number 32 out of it. I don't know. Pe write to me. Tell me if you ever got over 32 skips. That was the greatest number I ever got. Anyway, so water's boiling, and then just drop those down um, all the way around inside there, and, oh, look, they just fit. And... This now is the important part, to be able to get some flavoring in this one on each of the levels, because otherwise it is just, in fact, steamed vegetable, which is nice, but this just adds something special to it. This is the radiating lines of joy. And that's, that's a little chopped thyme and some freshly ground pepper. I hope it's a trademark of mine. I know it is of hundreds of people who love good food, so join us. And just a little tiny drop of salt. Not, not a lot. It really doesn't have to have a lot of salt. There's a lot of salt which stores up within these vegetables, just comes out of the ground, you know, without having to add to it. Okay, so put that on there. Now you're going to need 22 minutes of cooking time altogether for these little fellows. So you just put those on, cook those for 16 minutes. Now, 
at the end of 16 minutes, they're going to look like this. Let me just put these on ahead of time. And this is the other kind of steamer that I'd like to suggest to you. This one is stainless steel and will last forever. So those, if you just poke them just gently, you'll see that they're almost done, but they've just got a lovely little bit of texture to them. You don't want pappy. You want to sort of bite to them. Okay, so now put this on the top. That's the second steamer, perforated, you know, thing on, on top here, so there's to be able to let the steam through. And into that, I'm going to put a couple of tomatoes, show you how those look. Um, the tomato, I think, when you do this, um, please, um, serving tomatoes, it's just a little thing of mine, but take the core out. It's not a nice thing to come up against. Um, it, it's not nasty, but I mean, it's just something that needs to be taken from the tomato. And here, just, just incise the top of the tomato a little bit so as to let the seasoning go down, and put that in. By the way, if you find uh, one about this size, which, uh, which you love the look of, but it is in fact still green, do this with it. Um, take the tomato and put it with the core side down in a bag with a green apple. And if you do that, the ethylene gas from the green apple will come up and will help to ripen the tomato quicker for you, so you can get on with it. All right. Now, a uh, little bit of time again. I wanted to make it easy. You could put fresh basil or basil or oregano in there if you prefer. Lots of different herbs you could try, but always the black pepper and always just a little bit of a touch of salt in the top. Okay? Good. Second one. Now, how about a green vegetable? Because this, this is classic. In fact, it's so, so much of a classic, I put it on the front cover of the book, you know, the covers of series. It's so good. Um, here, then, is, is spinach, all right? Now, you buy spinach just like this. You'd, it has, you know, uh, quite heavy stalk ends. And so I would take all those stalk ends off just in, in one fell swoop. And then place the spinach. I, th this has been washed beforehand. But get it under water and, and, and rinse it really well. Keep tossing it around and around and around in the water. And a, a way of checking this, if you've got one of those kind of uh, sinks where you can do it, a, a white sink, you can always check for little bits of, uh, of earth to come out from the bottom. Otherwise, take a bowl, look in there, no earth. Good. Actually, that's the, you'll have to wash it a bit more in order to get it down like that. See, when it's like this, and before you put it into the steamer, freshly grind black pepper on it, a little bit of salt, just a soup song. And, incredibly, some shaved nutmeg. Just a little nutmeg shaver here. And shave about a quarter of a teaspoonful of nutmeg into it. And, and when you taste that, it, it has that sort of spiciness to it, which is just gorgeous. Right, when the tomato's been going for three minutes, all right, uh, lift the lid up there and just put uh, the spinach right over the top. Just stack it over the top there. Okay? And, in fact, it, it, you can actually bounce the whole pound of it on the top. If you like, that's just enough. I just want to make sure that it's done when we try it. All right. Now, next thing is just the cheese. And this is the big deal. If you go to uh, one of those marvelous family restaurants and they say vegetarian plate, by the way, always put a clip or something, um, keep your cheese in a block form, and do keep it in a plastic bag. It saves it from getting all sort of dry. Um, it'd be fairly dry anyway, but this is drier still. Um, and, and then on goes the cheese sauce, right? You want your vegetarian dish and cheese plate with, with cheese sauce. And this cheese sauce has to apparently, by the way, this is, um, this is a piece of Parmesan. Parm it isn't Parmigiano Reggiano. You know that because it's got this black plastic shield on the outside. That says that it's American. So this is an American copy of the um, Italian Parmesan. It's a very good cheese. And, um, and I'm going to get back to what I was saying in just a moment. <laughs> it's a very good cheese. And if you use a little, this is the simplest grating device I know. It's, a, it's called a cheese stroker, at least that's what I call it. And so stroke that out so that you've got just four tablespoons full of cheese. You'll have to, I, I, I'm going to estimate that that's just about that for four people. Um, just one tablespoonful per head. Keep that on, <coughs> on one side, it's good, great taste. Well, you see, what the trouble is, you've got this incredible looking um, uh, vegetable dish, <laughs> all right? 
and then this velvety soft cheese stuff is all over the top of it. That adds up. It truly does. I know it tastes delicious, but it adds up. All right, let's have a look at this. Um, what I normally do uh, with the spinach is take the spinach here, and it, it's that quick to do. This is at the end of the 22 minutes. So you just take the spinach, place it into a sieve, and if it's got any surplus water on it at all, you've got to press that out. All right, keep that there for a moment. And this is what it looks like now. You take... Oh, look at that. It's, it's so magnificent. When you actually serve one of these things, it's fabulous. And here, here are the slices uh, of the... Oh, look, look. Just one. I mean, <laughs> I'm, I've, I'm already tasting it in, in my mouth. And then spinach on the side. There, look, look. Look at the plateful of it. Tuck the ends in. And then one tablespoonful of cheese, which is amazing how liberal it can look. Right? So that's done. And just a little bit of freshly ground pepper over the whole thing, just to let them know that you've got a pepper mill. <sighs> it's ready. Shall we look at the numbers? Come along. Now, these numbers are really exciting when compared with the one with the cheese sauce. So that, I think that looks pretty good. And, and there's a headiness of the, of the aroma that comes. You see, it sparkles instead of just being all dull, like it could have been. Right, okay, compared then with the cheese sauce one, 106 calories, so you've taken it down, you know, virtually 100. Fat, you 10 from that cheese sauce one, and this is two, one of which is saturated, six before. So 44% of the calories can actually come from the fat source with a vegetarian dish. Isn't that amazing? Um, this is down to 16%, which is very good. Cholesterol, only four, super. Sodium, 131. You may, uh, there's that little dusting that I gave every now and again. And then the dietary fiber is three. Okay, let's have a look. <laughs> this actually, I have to tell you, is one of the most wonderful things to eat in the whole world. I take just a little bit of, of the tomato and a little bit of that soft melting portion there and oh God, I've got a spinach leaf. I'm gonna have it all together huh? <sighs> mm. I look back on my past at all the towering marvelous creations I've eaten all my life and I didn't know that something like this was there oh it's so good please give it to people you love and like <laughs> It's very good. Springboard the idea of the stack and steam. See. Okay. Now, I'll springboard too. Now, and I'll do a dish, but I'll add some fish into that as well and show you how to do one pot, okay, on one element, okay? Just a whole dinner and just one element. Huh? Coming right up. Right, well, now, um, by the way, that, that dish there is, is on the front cover of the book, you know, I mean, look at it, you know, it, it really is a splendid dish. Right, now, here we go. Uh, in the bottom of the pot this time, it's just a slight difference. This is the whole idea of springboarding, so I'll show you the technique and then the difference. Now, here, rolling around, is the, is the skin of one lemon and four... Um, sage leaves. This is a little somewhat wilted now, but there's a sage leaf and a bay leaf here. And that's it. Four sage leaves, one bay leaf and a bit of lemon. And what's happening already is that it's extracted flavor from there. And so when I actually steam something in this, it's really going to sort of um, catch on, you know, with the fish that I'm going to do. Um, when you um, do fish, you can either do it specially, and I'll, I'll do one of those dishes for you sometime, where it drips down into the liquid and then you save the liquid. But in this case, I want to season the fish with the liquid. And so I'm going to place just this in a plate with some lemon slices on top. I'll show you how to do that in a sec. And around the outside of the plate should be enough space for the air to come up, for the steam to come and get to it, all right? Now, um, the next uh, layer, and I might as well do this at the same time because this actually takes 16 minutes, 13 minutes altogether, right? 13 minutes for the fish to cook. Um, you can actually do a small potato, and these are cut with a little ring around them just to say, 
to your loved ones, see, you, you're, you're worth it. You know, just do a little bit of extra tiddly bits. You know. This is for two people, by the way, on one element. Um, so put that on the top too, and that's going to just cook through in the same 13-minute period of time. So that's great. So that we can just leave that on the go, and let me show you what I was actually doing. Here is the, um, the fish this time. It's called halibut, and uh, it would come usually in a piece like this, if you take it in a whole piece. And when you take in a whole piece, look, please, at some certain things about it. One, it should have a lovely uh, either white or black skin to it because it's, um, it, it's a flat fish, so it's, it's black on the top for camouflage purposes and white underneath, you see. Um, but it should be lovely and glossy. And then when you turn it over, you, you, you might just see this here, if I just turn it like that. See how translucent that is? how shiny, um, it is perfectly fresh. And, and when you've got a little bit of color in it, it's, it's almost like an opal. And when you touch it with your fingers, and it's a bit difficult when you're buying fish, I understand that with the fishman. And you just simply put your fingertips together. If, they, if they're too tacky, you might start to think uh, of going the other way. And, and, uh, and smell it, too. <laughs> I can just see you in a supermarket going through this trouble. But anyway, please look at it. See how that looks. That's beautiful fresh fish. All right. So you've got it like that. Get a lemon and, um, and just simply carve off the top and bottom shoulders of the lemon like that. And then take, taking um, a sharp a small knife like this, just cut sort of barrel shapes around it. What I'd like to try and do here is to be able to get all of the heavy inside pith and skin out of the way. I've got little bits by the look of it there, but it's going quite well. And then um, cut this in very fine slices. The idea is that we actually want to get a, a kind of garnish going that actually cooks on the fish at the very same time. Okay, so that's done. Um, and then very tiny, hello. <laughs> Very tiny, thin slices right across. And just keep praying as you go through that it's one of those ones without any seeds in it, without any pips. So that, oh, there's a pip. All right, try and get the pips out of the way when you get down to it. One, two, three, four, five, six. Oh, well, that'll cover it. Um, and then just lay that, those overlapping over the top of the fish like that. No, oh, nice. And it's a very frail and gentle kind of garnish, but it also seasons the fish at the same time and does without having to sort of um, lace the thing with salt any more than it is already. And uh, so I think that looks pretty good. All right. Now that is how it goes into the pot, and I showed you how that works. Then um, some vegetables here. This is the courgette, as it's called, or a zucchini, um, trimmed top and bottom. Run the knife blade down and through it, and then just halve it once again, just like that. That's ready to go. And some asparagus. Oh, don't you love it when asparagus comes into season? Especially asparagus like this. You see, I, I don't like asparagus where it looks like redwood trees, you know, the, the, the great big fat things, um, uh, unless they come from Belgium cellars. They're quite fun. Um, send, send in a card if you don't know what I'm talking about. I haven't got time. Um, so here is the, the, about the thickness of it, about pencil size, and um, just for two people, just enough to be able to just get the palm of your hand around. Okay. Well, let's look at this. Now, about, uh, when it's had about this amount of time, then just um, raise the lid and pop in the, the two branches of the... And I, I always keep them separate so, so as to um, make sure I've got exactly the right amount, you know, for, for Trina and the right amount for me. Ah, look, put these in, um, green side down, all right, like you lay turf, and all done. A little bit of pepper and just, just sprinkled over the top. You'll need about eight minutes on these. And a little bit of salt over the top there. Hee, lovely. And smash it on. Gosh, it's just one element, one pot, two people. Great. Sauce. Now, this is what I call a whip. And a whip means that it's a work in progress, and I just thought it would be nice to be able to share something with you as a work in progress just for once. And what this is, is strained yogurt, you know, which is the customary thing that we do with strained yogurt. Just take um, a non-fat yogurt and uh, put it in one of these little uh, strainers here and keep it for about five hours and it goes lovely and smooth like this. Then take just a little, um, just a knife blade and 
what that means is just the tip of a knife, okay? Just the tip, just about that much, of saffron. Now, I don't like artificial colors, so I color things with things which are real, and so saffron colors that a beautiful buttery, lemony kind of color, doesn't it? It looks like mayonnaise, almost. Um, about an, an eighth of a teaspoon, I say to work in progress because we're, we're doing this at the moment, one eighth of a teaspoon, and really excited about what this can mean. Um, a, a teaspoonful of maple syrup, because of that really acidic taste that you can get sometimes, you know, from, from yogurt. Um, a tablespoonful of parsley, and just a couple of sloshes of Ariel. You see, you can do a couple of sloshes. When you're doing work in progress, you, you, can, you can actually slosh it in. Now, I'd like you to try this and see what you think. If, if you love buttery sauces and mayonnaises and everything else, you may say to yourself, yeah, Graham, you know, a little bit of salt, perhaps, right? Graham, I think that's a little, you know, acidic on the back of the tongue. And I said, fine, well, if it, why don't you just use the 2% yogurt and strain that and, you know, creep up on it, all right? Now, that's lovely. That's right. Okay, well, this has still got four minutes to go. <laughs> I'll tell you what. Here, here look. Um, Aerobic exercise, very good, you know, lose weight and everything else like this. Here's a quick one. Stand up. Do this with me. Hands on hips. Ready? Okay, go. Well, hope you followed that, Jane Fonda. <laughs> Gets the old blood going, doesn't it? Marvellous. It uh, runs off about 2,000 calories at the top. Johnny nearly killed me. Right, now, I, I see what happened just as we were running around. Everything came out of the pot. <laughs> just, I can't guarantee that will happen. But here's something I would like you to see. When you actually lift it off, the best way of doing this is just to drop it down like so, so that you can get at the fish easily. It's just a basin and just push it over the top. It really works well. Okay, then the sauce uh, that I'd done... Just a little sauce, I think, should go over in the classical way, uh, just to go over the ends of the asparagus, just like that, all right? And then you can just have a little bit of that. You don't need to smother it. Never smother things in sauce. Right, shall we have a look at the numbers? All right, let's have a go. Now, the numbers in this case,